Yes, of course. My name is Rosamira Guillem. I am the executive director of uh, Fundación Proyecto Titi, a nonprofit organization in Colombia that works to protect the cutest little monkey ever, the, the one pound cotton top tamarinds. Um, and we're based in Northern Colombia, which is the only place on earth where you find this little monkey and uh, hoping to create um, strong connections between people and the monkeys and nature and its habitat so that we can secure a long-term future for this amazing little primate. Yes, we love that. And we definitely love the community involvement and everything. Um, and I was reading that you guys started up in the 80s. You've been around that long? Just about um, mid 80s, Dr. Ann Savage, who is the founder of Project okay. Petiti, she came from the US to Colombia to uh, do her uh, dissertation for her PhD. And she studied cutting tops for a couple of years. Um, one of the first few studies that uh, were around back then to learn about the monkeys, how they behave in the wild, how, um, you know, everything about them just because they were so endangered. Um, and then she fell in love with the monkey, with the country, with the people. <laughs> it's hard not to. <laughs> yes. And then she, um, for a while, she kept the project running until we met um, uh -huh. back in the, the late 90s and became partners. And um, it's been a few years now, well, 30 or so, uh -huh. that we have collaborated and make the project grow. That's very, that's awesome. Um, I love to hear that you know, you've been around that long and you've been able to grow. Um, and then um, hearing about that field research, um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? I know you guys are very heavy on the field research and watching them and their natural habitats and learning how to help them there. Right, actually that's how the whole project started. It was a research project. Um, and what we just wanna do is make sure that we understand uh, the behavior uh, of the monkey the diet, reproduction patterns, uh, just habits, uh, social uh, composition, social behavior, group composition, territory, everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, with the intent of creating or generating scientific information, but also using that as the most valuable resource to protect the species uh, and to connect them with the different audiences. So everything we produce in the field, we use it to feed or to inform our other programs, social programs and forest conservation programs um, in order to make it uh, suitable for what cotton tops need to you know, thrive in the wild. Yeah, but um, I was reading a bit about everything that you guys do on your website and it looks like you have lots of programs. And I was going through your YouTube and you have amazing videos of um, your biologists in the field and stuff like that. Um, and I really wanted to ask you about your education programs because Safe Worldwide also has some similar programs and we're really interested in spreading the message about those, especially informing children and young adults um, to help them be part of the conservation community in the future. Exactly. And, you know, when, when the project started, you know, a few years after, you know, our founder, Dr. Dr. Savage, realized that science alone wasn't enough mm -hmm. to, uh, to save the species from extinction. So we learned the value of involving communities. And from the early years, we started involving kids, you know, which are fun to work with. They're, you know, their, their minds are fresh. It's really easy to connect them emotionally with our work. So we have developed a series of education programs that start with uh, the, the little ones, the, you know, the fourth, fifth grade. And the, it's through puppet shows, games, uh -huh. drawing. And um, what teaches this program is that uh, cotton tops are, are not good pets. So uh, yeah. uh, hunt, hunting them and keeping them as a pet is another big threat for them. Uh -huh. So we kind of want to wanna plant that seed in their minds and understand that there are animals that can live with us humans and animals that are better in their home. So mm -hmm. that's the intent of that program. Then we go into a little program called Amiguao, which teaches kids to train their dogs to kind of enforce the, the concept of having domestic animals with you and not wild animals, so just dogs, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, then it goes to secondary school and kids have a semester program where they learn more about cotton tops, you know, and, and we try to develop this a sense of pride 
in understanding that this is the only place on earth where cotton tops are found mm -hmm. in the wild. This is it, just a little piece of land in Northern Colombia. And that really opens the, their eyes. It's like, really? Wow, yeah. yes, they're special, we're special. It's our responsibility to care for them. In this program, they go to the forest and they see the animals in the wild. Those groups that our biologists are studying permanently, then they get to see how we look for them using telemetry, how we take notes about everything they do. And that is really amazing. It's like an adventure for them because they don't see that or they don't have access mm -hmm. to that at all. And then we select like the most motivated ones and create a, a, like a leadership program. And these kids do little projects in their homes or with their families in their neighborhoods. And, and every so we have had the chance to help educate a couple of them to, um, to continue on <clears throat> their career as environmental, uh, in environmental sciences. So it's oh, like I a continuum. And, and then we have developed ways to measure pre and post so that mm -hmm. we can measure knowledge. And we're still battling with measuring attitudes and behavior, but we're in the process of doing that because we really want to understand how that's impacting. And, um, you know, so far the results are very positive and uh, give, give us a lot of hope for the future. Good, that's awesome. Um, another community program that I saw that mm -hmm. I thought was amazing and um, I really want to highlight is that you have a lot of economical um programs for the communities um near the cotton tops in northern Colombia um that promote that um economic and environmental balance between the two um if you could tell us just a little bit about those so, so the social side of our programs uh is you know our education programs <laughs> that I just mentioned and then the programs for the adults which is a whole different yeah <laughs> Here, here, it is about subsistence. People hunt animals and cut trees because they need to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, there's very few job opportunities in these rural communities that live by the forest, and that is where we work. So we try to create alternatives uh, or agreements that allow them to improve their livelihood, but they commit to certain behaviors that we are expecting, such as not having cotton tops as pets, not hunting them, and protecting pieces of forest that... We used to uh, increase the habitat, but also connect isolated fragments because cotton tops never come down to the ground. They're always hanging up, up there. Uh, so they need connectivity or, you know, making it viable mm -hmm. in the long term. So some of those programs, and I'm going to excuse myself, I'm going to reach out to one of the plush that our communities no make that yeah. I don't have. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's not going to look good in the video, but here it is. It's the I little saw that plush. they're adorable. I want one. <laughs> one is beautiful. Them. Yes. They're very so, cute. So the ladies, the group of ladies make this uh, by hand, and that's a way to generate an income for their families in these local communities. Some other group of women make uh, beautiful tote bags um, mm -hmm. and uh, made with recycled plastic bags. Um, for a long time, we were recycling plastic to make fence posts to reduce the use of wooden posts. We're using a different strategy now, but that created a lot of uh, involvement as well. And our most recent program is in, 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 um, in, um, in a partnership with the National Park System and another NGO, local NGO, where we work with farmers through conservation agreements where they commit to saving part of their forest in their land. We restore it. It grows. To connect forest uh, areas and in turn they receive for instance um, poultry uh, they receive equipment to to produce honey or they receive fruit trees uh, seeds and it helps their crops improve what they produce and doing it sustainably and that way you know we we'll start looking for that balance that I, I would say that our community works are probably community work is the most challenging of all our, our pieces of our, of our puzzle, but it's definitely the one that we want to be able to succeed on um, mm -hmm. to find, just find the balance where animals can thrive in the wild and people can find their, also their uh, equilibrium and, and just a better livelihood for them and their family. Yeah, I always, when I'm writing articles or anything, I always say that there can't be, we can't just focus on the conservation of animals without addressing the problems that people are facing, yes. you know, exactly. near those animals and in those communities. So I, I really love that. Um, so kind of switching to the cotton top, um, can you just tell um, our viewers a little bit about 
you know, their history. I know deforestation and biomedical research were big um, factors in their endangerment. And then maybe just about, you know, their personalities, how they thrive in the wild and stuff like that. Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, cotton tops are just one pound monkeys, as you see. <laughs> just, just These are a little chubbier than the real one, <laughs> but just about. So long tail, crazy hair, mm -hmm. Einstein style is a rock star of the forest. Uh, <laughs> So they're just very little, but they're very similar to us humans, you know, mm -hmm. and they live in family groups like we do, mom, dad, and the babies. When the babies grow and become juveniles, they either get kicked out of the house or they leave like we do <laughs> to, to create our own families, right? Um, they're very territorial. So they live in an area within the forest and fight for it. If anyone wants to invade, just like we do with our homes, Babies mm -hmm. learn everything from their parents, just like we do. They do have a very sophisticated uh, communication system through vocalizations that we have learned to identify by studying them in the wild, like when they're angry, when they're nervous, when they're hungry, or when they call for an alarm. Um, and uh, they feed mostly from fruits that grow in many different trees in the forest, but in the dry season, um, they feed from insects a lot and also sap from trees. So they wait for the woodpecker to come and make a little hole in the trunk and then the sap comes out and they come and lick that. <laughs> They're in. like, all the hard work's done. We can go get the sap. <laughs> sure. But uh, that's been very important because all of that information of, of the food that they eat in the forest and in the trees where they sleep is what we're using for our forest restoration program. So you see how everything mm -hmm. kind of starts getting connected in between. Yeah. But yeah, um, beautiful. So their, their threats are mostly related to uh, deforestation due to cattle ranching and agriculture, and most recently mining and urban expansion, but also capture for the pet trade. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, the numbers um, show, the bibliography shows that in the 60s and 70s about 30,000 were exported to the U.S. for biomedical research. Mm -hmm. and, and the number that we estimate now through our field research program is there's about 7,000 left in the wild. Okay. We're going to do, uh, next year, we, we plan to do a third population census after 10 years of the last one, of the second one. And we're hoping to see a better scenario after 10 years of really working hard to protect yeah. the species. I really and, hope so yeah. too. It sounds like you guys are doing amazing work. So hopefully they're benefiting from that. Um, and then just um, <laughs> um, just a little bit about what you guys, you kind of went into it, but what you guys hope for the future um, of your sanctuary um, and where you kind of see envision it going from here i know you guys have been around a while so you're pretty robust by this point but if you guys do have um future plans um just a little bit about those we have learned and, and we have grown quite a bit over the last 10 years in particular but um, um still our hope is to increase the scale and the reach of our conservation work mm -hmm. even though cotton tops live in a small area when you look at the big map you know, inside that distribution area, we need to expand and cover more areas that still have forests and cotton tops. And that's our hope. Right now we have two sites, which, which basically cover the most important forest clusters that there are left. And there's a third one we, we were hoping to begin last year, but COVID uh, yeah. put a hold on that. So we're hopeful that next year we can go there. And there's a couple of more to the far south that we would at some point like to reach. But our, our hope is to continue protecting and expanding uh, forested areas through the combination of strategies that include us creating sanctuaries, farmers creating forest corridors within their land, and then working with the environmental authorities to increase the public protected areas. But, but then we have a very ambitious uh, plan that we hope to develop over the next 10 years. And it is um, to create a huge corridor between the area where we have our reserve and another regionally protected area, which is about you know, 30 miles away from each other. But you know, such a big project that has generated a lot of interest will basically guarantee that there's enough habitat for the monkeys and for wildlife in general. Mm -hmm. To, uh, to have a, a future in the wild. 
while people respect and also find their their own balance for the families. That's the hope. It's very ambitious, but I think we've learned a lot. (laughs) I think we've learned a lot to use all all of that knowledge for this ambitious project. It definitely sounds like an extremely well-rounded program. So I wouldn't be surprised if you guys succeed (laughs) in that. Um, And then um, just a little bit about how people can get involved. Um, I read somewhere that Mm -hmm. people might be able to visit. I don't know if that's still the case with COVID and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, And just kind of, you know, respectfully see um, your program and the cotton tops and respect communities and the animals in the process. Yes, actually, uh, another of the community programs that we had put together was a, a small uh, kind of an ecotourism offering that involved uh, the local communities. Um, it was a, like a day package where you could see the monkeys in the wild. Then you could see, you could um, interact with the farmers and see how they, you know, do their crops. And, and then you can visit with the artisans and learn to crochet with plastic bags. So it was like a day experience, but yeah. with, a, with a very strong social con, uh, content. Um, we're hoping, we're looking forward to uh, the opportunity to resume our, um, that ecotourism activity. But we have to wait probably by next year. We're getting okay. ready. Mm-hmm. We love to host people. And um, the package has a, a portion that is a contribution to the Farmers Association, the Artisans Association, and of course, a donation to Play Activity. Um, so we're hoping to do that in the future, be able to welcome visitors again. But uh, there's an, other opportunities that are opening up uh, specifically related to uh, our forest restoration program and the opportunity to, um, uh, to uh, you know, have volunteers that can help us in the nursery. So uh, we do have a forest restoration program within our sanctuary. We have a nursery. We collect seeds, propagate, get them to about one, two feet, and then we plant them in those corridors or in those areas where uh, we want to recreate the forest. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it would be amazing. You know, it's a lot of work there, but it would be amazing to have volunteers come and, um, you know, help us fill in the little bags, plant the little mm-hmm. saplings as they germinate. There was a lot of saplings on those pictures. Yeah. Weeding, you know, there's a lot of work in that. And then planting is a little mm-hmm. uh, more demanding, but it, it, I think I think our forest restoration work can certainly provide opportunities for people to come uh, visit, hang out with us, uh, and it will be great help because resources are always limited. Um, we, we have amazing partners and supporters, but um, as we want to grow, we definitely always need the help. So mm-hmm. you can learn more about our work in, in our website, projectedtp.com, or just connect with us on social media that at projectedtp. Yeah. yeah, and all your social media tags are on your website and everything, and I'll include those in the Thank link you. as well. Um, <laughs> yeah, of course. And is there anything um, critical that you want people to really have it stick with them about the cotton top or about your program um you know just something anything you want to add specifically that you think people should really carry with them thinking about the conservation of the tamarind yes well well besides uh you know besides visiting our social media and and websites if you want to learn more there's great videos on our youtube Mm -hmm. channel where you can see a little more of our work but uh, a lot of people ask us how they can get involved uh, beyond uh, the, the opportunities or visiting or, but, you know, like, like supporting the communities by purchasing or, you know, giving this as presents mm-hmm. to your friends or use it for corporate gifts, or mm-hmm. it's a great way to help these communities that are living on making plush toys or making eco mochilas. You can, you can see them on our website. Um, and, and, and again, um, it's a great way to support um, we definitely, you know, uh, live on the support of kind people all around the world uh, that are become our friends. Many of them become our friends and our supporters. Other are just, you know, giving us like, go, go, go. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, it, and it all helps us keep the energy, keep the passion, keep it all going. So um, there's, there's also campaigns that we develop every so often. We will do one soon for... Uh, um, making more fence posts with recycled okay. plastic and mm-hmm. probably uh, also uh, propagating more trees. So there's just great ways to get involved in the distance, but also here when it's in possible to come, yeah. <laughs> to come and visit and plant lots of trees and give us a hand with that. So um, we love to host people and to show our projects. So, you know, 
open doors for you guys and for anyone who wants to learn more about our project and support our efforts. Very nice. That all sounds wonderful. And I'm sure there's lots of people that would love to do that, either from, you know, the back support or the front support either way. Um, well, thank you so much for um, spending some time with me this morning. I know it's early there um, and giving us um, an explanation on Proyecto TT and what you guys are doing. It sounds amazing. Um, we will be sending out a newsletter um, about you guys with the interview and just some information on the on top and how people can get involved and also on our social media um, all over there. So there will definitely be lots of... <laughs> Lots of prayer to TT <laughs> <Excellent>. Spotlight. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again to Rosamira from Proyecto TT and make sure to visit Proyecto TT to figure out how you can donate, shop, and visit them and support their local communities and their mission to save the cotton top. 